So good luck. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's great to be here. I want to thank Dardan and the team for organizing B sites. We now we know how much effort is needed, so well done. Um, it's looking great. So today I'm going to speak about using common attack database and intent clustering to protect websites, mobile apps, and APIs. Apparently, this doesn't like me. <laughs> yeah, I'll just use this. Thank you. So first, I want to give an introduction of who I am. So um, uh, my current job is a lead data analyst at Netasia, a Manchester-based company where I work closely with threat uh, research team and data science team to identify and protect, protect web services and uh, API from the recent threat attacks, basically. Uh, I'm also co-founder and organizer at Besides Tirana. We have called for papers open. It's the second edition that we are running this year. If you want, you can have a look and submit your talk. If you are looking for any instructions, either myself or Rio, we are happy to support and give our feedback. Uh, I'm also an organizer and team at Illyrian Brains. So Illyrian ba Brains is a community-based uh, organization. Uh, the focus is to bring together all Albanian professionals um, worldwide, uh, do meetups, webinars, and have fun together. <laughs> so I'm interested in threat hunting, bots, cybersecurity, threat analytics, and threat protections. Um, my name is Paulina Chakali. You can also find me in social media, in LinkedIn, Twitter, or uh, GitHub. So... Sorry. Okay. So the agenda for today will be what automated threats are we facing today? Kill chain investigation, mapping, mapping attacks to blade framework, uh, threat attack sophistication level, what is CAT common attack database, clustering method used to identify malicious traffic, uh, analyzing bad bots behaviors, and also using machine learning to identify bots bypassing CAPTCHAs. So first, let's start with the automated threats, like uh, the most recent automated threats that we see in my day-to-day -day job are like credential stuffing, account takeover, uh, fake account creation, scalper and sneaker bots, web scraping, uh, gift card abuse, and also there are so many other automated threats that we are facing nowadays that are causing like either financial damage or reputational damage to the businesses. So I wanted to give uh, an uh, introduction about Blade Framework. So Blade Framework is similar to Mitre Framework. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that everyone uh, here knows about the phases, tech, tactics, and techniques of the Mitre Framework. So created knowledge base of adversary tactics and techniques based on real-world observations of business logic attacks. There are six phases, uh, distinct stages that a business logic attack may progress through. Uh, there are 24 tactics, the strategies employed by adversaries during specific phases, and also 80 techniques, the specific actions or methods performed to achieve tactical goals. Uh, and then we will explain um, and map attacks to Blade Framework. We'll start with the credential stuffing kill chain overview. So what is a credential stuffing bot? A credential stuffing bot is used to test previously leaked credentials, typically usernames and password pairs that you can either buy in, in dark web, um, to determine if they are valid on a target web service or API. These bots validate credentials pairs against their target web, web service or APIs by automating login attempts, allowing adversaries to test and validate credentials at mass scales. So when we talk about credential stuffing bots, um, the endpoints will be login endpoints that uh, adversaries basically will uh, try to attack. In the credential staffing bot, uh, the Blade framework has like six phases. Uh, the first phase is resource development, uh, where basically the attacker will um, 
produce the tools that they need to attack, and then we have the reconnaissance stage where basically um, the attacker will know what is the specific target, uh, which in this case, as I said before, is login endpoints, and then defense bypass, attack execution, actions on the objectives, and post-attack. Uh, so we, I mean, this kind of attack is the most seen attack recently. Also the scalper bot and sneaker bots, I mean, I'm pretty sure you might have heard about the PS5 launch when we had this, you know, crazy stuff going with the PS5s. But also recently in the Eurovision Song Contest, like the tickets went at around one, uh, sorry, 11,000 pounds because of bots doing this, you know, scalping all the tickets and like reselling them. Um, also, I wanted to give some information about the fake account creation bot. Fake account creation bots abuse the sign up process of a web service to create user accounts in bulk using stolen or fake identities. So yeah, mostly on the fake account creation attacks, they target register endpoints. Uh, these bots automate multiple sign up requests, which can be spread out over long periods of time of using IP addresses from different geolocations to hide the fact that they are controlled by by one person. I mean, the, resident, the attacks coming from residential proxy networks might be a good example of these kind of uh, attacks coming from fake account creation bots. Many advanced fake account creation bots can also bypass email, phone, and CAPTCHA verifications. Uh, Mapping to the Blade framework, here we see five phases. They are pretty much the same phases, so I'm not going to uh, mention the same ones. So I'm moving to the next attack, which is Scraper Bot and Scalping. Um, this is the same group of, um, no, sorry, this is Scraper Bot. Um, web scraping is the use of bots to gather content of data from websites. They can scrape product um, endpoints, the prices of the products. It might be a competitor who is trying basically to scrape all your website and like to clone it and uh, create the same website. On, or they can play with the prices. Like if you have, if you are selling the same products, they can manipulate the prices and make more business th than you. Um, again, this goes over six phases, resource development, reconnaissance, defense bypass, attack execution, actions on the objectives, and post-attack. And the last one I wanted to talk today is Scalper and Sneaker Bot group, breaking the kill chain with Blade. So here we have, it's interesting because some of the use cases that we mentioned before are part of this uh, attack, basically. So the first phase of the Scalper Bot is monitoring targeted websites, creating accounts and scraping products. So fake account creation, credential stuffing, account takeover, and product scraping up are part of the phase one of this attack. And then, like, if I'm a, an attacker, I'll scrape your products, I'll create either fake accounts or compromise, like, um, existing accounts to do some product scraping. And then what I'll do, I'll add all the stuff into the basket or add to cart abuse, where bots hit the basket massively. They simulate many users, and um, we have speedy scripted bots. Uh, from my experience, we have seen that these attacks um, last for seconds or minutes um, in web services or API, so they are very fast. That's why they use uh, speed descript bots. And the last phase is checkout abuse. Bots hit checkout endpoints. Uh, in this, the, the, the last phase, they do credit card and gift card fraud as well. So the reason why they do this is uh, because they want um, to gain discounts, basically, and um, spend less money, and then they do multiple purchases exceeding limits out of stock, and this is mostly used for limited edition products like Adidas GZ or Nike shoes or the PS5 or any other product that um, is limited edition, basically. Uh, so one important um, step on analyzing automated threats is a sophistication level. Um, there are four levels. This is how I see in my day-to-day -day job. Um, the first one is the easy level where we have a, an attack coming from high volume of requests. Um, and they, it's like a combination of all categories, like one single user, one single IP, one single user agent, one single data center and country. So if we have a high volume of requests coming from this a, co a combination of these categories is very easy to spot as basically we can see a peak in the high number of requests and like mathematically uh, we can analyze that quickly and like identify that attack. 
And then the second phase is moderate level, high volume of requests coming from multiple users and clients, but we have unique user agents, data centers, and countries. Um, so in this case, it's, it's, it's still manageable, I would say, like you can build a system with rules and like you can still identify these attacks. It's, it's easy. And then we move in the more sophisticated levels, which is sophisticated level, high volume of requests coming from multiple users, clients, user agents, data centers, but country. Still in this case, I would say that it's manageable. I mean, we can easily mitigate these attacks as we can do geo-blocking, for example. I mean, you can do, um, in the mitigation strategy, you can block in a user ID, IP, user agent, data center, country, or ASN, or geographically, so these are still manageable. And then we go in the very sophisticated level of the tax. Uh, we, we see high number of requests, rotating sources. We see multiple categories doing this. So these are mostly uh, residential proxy network sources. So what bots do, they compromise res residential proxy networks and they um, behave, let's say, very similar with a human, and that's the most challenging uh, level of the attack that we see, uh, and we protect web services or APIs. I'll explain later how we do uh, and how we ensure the protection. So one of the stuff that we use, which basically mitigates in the first request, and it doesn't need a big science behind that, is CAD. So CAD is Common Attack Database. Um, it involves some lists. One of the lists that we have created is called Captcha Recommended Threat Lists. And this basically is uh, using all the experience, like we serve, let's say, a part of the traffic to Captcha services, and then we can see if something is uh, showing a human behavior or a bot behavior. And then what we do, we aggregate the data and we collect all uh, users that haven't been able to pass Captcha at 100%. And then this is called the Captcha Recommended Threat List and is part of the CAD. The next one is residential proxy IPs. So we do this geographically, like we collect all the residential proxy networks. Let's say if we are in Kosovo, we will, uh, we will collect all the lists for Kosovo. If we do business with um, United Kingdom, we'll collect the lists with United Kingdom. So it, basically we, we collect geographically. And then we have worst offenders, and these are basically values or entities that have been collected um, through a system of rules. Like we can use a system of rules, let's say like, okay, I can build the regex and I can spot like spoofed user agents, for example, or, um, or I can build another rule that can see if uh, an IP is coming through a VPN or like a private service. So there, these are like, you know, a system of rules that we build and then we classify if something is uh, malicious or spoofed um, and not representing a uh, human behavior. And also there are some other lists. So these lists uh, are coming from the model's output basically. So why we use CAD, as I said before, like you can um, mitigate in the first request you need zero second of pro preparation, really. Like, if you want protection in a web service or API, we say, okay, a model needs time to tune, to validate, uh, to do the performance measure, and all this. So here's the list we have, and we can protect your uh, website straight away. And then uh, I'll move in the clustering method, which is um, the most challenging part uh, in the detection, I would say. Um, there is a lot of mathematics behind the, let's say, machine learning models that uh, are used to identify bots. So first of, of all, this is a classification problem. So basically, we need to identify if a user is a human or a bot. Um, being a classification uh, problem, one of the most common methods that we use is a clustering method called dbscan, which is a density-based uh, clustering method. There are some hyperparameters uh, on the method. So first, we do data set loading aggregation. 
We aggregate the data so each row represents a categorical value and has a time series array for that category. Uh, and then we have the filtering, uh, filter out categories with a smaller presentation in the data and reduce the volume of data to be considered. And here, for example, when we speak about outliers, this method is really good because it removes the outliers so they are not included in the clusters. And this makes it very efficient for the problem that we have. Uh, noise adjustment, all time series contain a roughly, a roughly fixed amount of noise which interfer interferes with the distance metric due to scaling. So for the distance metric, we use usually, like by default, it's Euclidean um, distance, but you can explore uh, the method itself. Um, and the clustering algorithm is dbscan, a density-based clustering method, basically. And then we move in the reporting phase where, where we have like um, a list of cluster labeled. And then we do some, uh, we set some rules uh, and then we select, we do a cluster selection. And then, and then those clusters are used basically as recommendations for web services or APIs. So if you want to explore with um, dbscan um, clustering method, you can go in the psychic learn library and you can play around with the hyperparameters, you can play with the epsilon minimum sample of the data and you can see what's the impact basically. Um, so the next one, as I said, is cluster overview. So what the time series clustering method will do is it will identify uh, entities that have the same behaviors over time. So let's say if I'm a human and I want to buy, I don't know, a dress today, I'll go home, dress, red, and then check out payment, and that's it. If you are a bot, you will do a different behavior. The, pro the probability of myself doing the same behavior with someone else here at the same time, it's, I'll say, very close to zero, as it's very rare that all the people do the same behavior, let's say, within the same time period. Um, so what the method does, it it correlates, so basically it correlates together uh, based on the traffic pattern. So if uh, basically you have automated some bots, either coming from residential proxy networks, uh, this will be identified uh, from the behavior basically over time. So we have cluster labeled. In this case, we have a lot of clusters, like 26, it's a lot. The minus one cluster usually is unclassified data. So usually we're expecting this to be uh, entities of the data that haven't been able to classify or correlate together from the pattern in the trend. So this is interesting. I mean, usually it's recommended not to use this cluster, but it's interesting because sometimes you can find out that there are some unique bots uh, within this cluster. And then the other clusters, um, uh, so then you build like a system of rules in terms of selecting clusters, as it might be, let's say, traffic coming from semi-trusted uh, data centers that you don't want to block this kind of traffic as it's risky, it might cause false positives. Uh, this is a good method for uh, CAPTCHA as a, as a mitigation strategies, but if we are in hard blocking, for instance, for uh, mobile app traffic, it might be challenging and we need to set up some extra rules to make sure that this will be valid. And then we will see um, analyzing behaviors. So here are some of the clusters. Um, what is good about this method is that you can run that intent, let's say, in a user ID level, but you can also run that in a client level, user agent. So basically all the categories you have, e either in an ASN level, you can still run it and find like commonalities through ASNs, for instance. So here in the um, top left graph, you will see the minus one cluster. So hopefully you can see the automated behavior on the blue line and then the orange and red one. So usually this is unclassified, but still it's good evidence of, of finding out some um, weird behavior. And then you can see the other clusters that, you know, like the values correlate really good over time. So let's say in the top right one, um, you will see that there are how many lines? Like five lines or more, but they have all the same uh, basically behavior over time. So when the traffic goes down, these sources are doing the same behavior over time. And then we have um, the bottom right graph. This is either more volumetric in terms of the unique entities um, that are sending the attack. So here, for instance, it might be a residential proxy uh, network attacks, basically. 
that is using a very distributed list of um, users' IPs. They use the recent versions of uh, browsers, or and also they use semi-trusted data centers, and this makes it challenging, but still we can find out on the behavior, like which are the IPs or users that are doing this, and to recommend them straight away. So the last topic I wanted to talk today is bypassing CAPTCHAs, as this is a topic that it's very challenging uh, nowadays. Uh, so. Well, all the companies that have bot management as a strategy, as a product, uh, this is one of the parts that we see. We have a lot of discussions with customers and want to find a good, basically, um, solving solution. Uh, so what happens? So low-cost human labor to solve CAPTCHA images, they share the same cookies to stay active. Um, you can pay them for like very cheap, maybe $0.50 to solve 1,000 CAPTCHA frames. Uh, and then what they do, they keep the cookie active and they can really use the cookie and do the activity basically. Um, and then we have AI, chatbot, chat G G GPT, uh, et cetera, that can solve CAPTCHA with some human help again. But then we also have sophisticated bots that can bypass CAPTCHA by using AI tools. And let's say if we have a CAPTCHA like yesterday when um, Dardan was sharing the awards for the raffle, uh, we saw that you, know, you need to fill the CAPTCHA images. You can build a, an AI model that will be able to fill that and bypass the CAPTCHA. It's very easy, really. Uh, what we can do is that stop bad bots user from sharing cookies for more than X hours. Like you can um, add a rule, let's say, and say like, okay, if a user sh is uh, using this cookie for more than 12 hours, 24 hours, then stop it, like expire this cookie and they need to use a new cookie. And this is like a quick solution. It doesn't want a lot of exploratory data analysis and stuff. Uh, the other feature that we investigate is analyze the time that a bad bot needs to bypass CAPTCHA and compare this to time needed by humans. So this is time to pass CAPTCHA estimation. We visualize the distribution of time needed to bypass CAPTCHA and then we build the CAPTCHA abuse model. So basically the features that I mentioned before, like sharing cookies and also estimating the time to pass CAPTCHA, uh, we are able to build like a CAPTCHA abuse model. So what we do is uh, we uh, visualize the distribution of humans and bots um, bypassing CAPTCHAs and then we can see uh, what cluster basically, uh, so usually we'll have two clusters. One will, will represent bots and one will represent humans. And then it's very easy to spot with some rules which of the clusters basically it's uh, automated traffic. And then what we do is uh, we, um, we solve the problem with hard blocking in these cases. I've also visualized, um, so yeah, uh, this is bypassing CAPTCHA. So here I've listed some CAPTCHA farms. Um, I'm pretty sure there might be others as well, supported CAPTCHA versions, but most of them basically can be manipulated and like bypass. Um, the other one I wanted to uh, share some information is basically how we visualize the distribution of bots bypassing CAPTCHAs. So here are three different bots that were bypassing uh, the CAPTCHA and hopefully you can see how different and unique they are. So basically, basically you can see the purple line and that's a bot that is more stationary and like um, they need up to maybe for, uh, 50 seconds um, to bypass. And then we have a noise here of 90 seconds. So this bot, it's, you know, manipulating us. Like if we say, okay, we can't set the threshold and say like, okay, hum humans need like 40 seconds and bots need like, I don't know, 20 seconds before they used to need to take like 12 seconds to bypass. But now it's completely the opposite. They are behaving as humans and this makes it even more challenging. And then we have the red bar. So we can see that this bot is um, is bypassing before 20 seconds and in a much more number of requests, like up to 300 requests. And the third um, behavior of bot, I'll say, is bypassing in around 10 seconds, um, sending around 67 requests. So. Yeah, as I said, I mean, we see different behaviors, really, uh, and it's challenging. It's a new industry, I'd say, but it's definitely interesting. Um, this was my talk for today. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>
if you Thank have you, any Paulina. questions. Thank you, That was yeah. great. Feel Sorry about the ticker. I don't know why it wasn't working. Oh, no worries. No worries. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Let me go out there. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was great insight regarding data security. My only question was, uh, since you mentioned the AI, like ChatGPT or Microsoft Sydney or Google's Bard, uh, can we use those? Like, do you see uh, companies or different solutions using uh, AI as a protection measure, like to counterfeit these ty types of bots or uh, the engines that want to pass captures or whatever? Stuff like that. Like, do you see uh, these AI helping us or helping companies in uh, mitigating data security in web apps, applications, and what? Um, yeah, thank you for your question. I mean, from my experience, I don't think there is like a, like a chat GTP version or something else that it's protecting from these kind of trends. It might be in the future. Who knows? Like, you know, AI is evolving very quickly. Um, so at the end of the day, we're still building machine learning models to protect this. So if we automate it in an AI level, like chat GPT, and like we say, okay, uh, identify if this is a bot or user, it will be really good. But um, until now, in my uh, knowledge, no. Thank you. Thank you no very worries. much. No Thank you. Do we have any other question? Paulina, thank you so much. That was very insightful. Thank you.